Shalom. This week we are reading Parshat Toldot. Story of the forefathers is in high gear. This week we are reading about Yitzchak, the blessings that he gave to Yaakov and Esau, the story of the birthright, and the conflict from the very beginning between Yaakov and Esau. The forefathers, they're called the Avot. They're called the Avot HaOlam. They're really called the forefathers, the fathers, the patriarchs of the world. Their whole uh, life's work was in trailblazing a path of divine service for their children, the Jewish people, and really for the whole world. Everything that we're learning about in these parshiot, the complex relations between the characters, the incredible acts of, of righteousness and the incredible, um, almost, um, they almost cry out this tremendous rendezvous with destiny. All of these episodes that we're learning about, these are the beginnings of a process of, of clarification and determination of spiritual paths that will change the future of the whole world. And this is one aspect of the teaching that our sages tell us, Ma'aseh Avot Siman Lebanim, that everything that our forefathers did and were involved with and everything that befell them, it's all a sign of things to come for their children. And one aspect of this is that everything that they were all about, the forefathers, it was about setting in motion huge cosmic processes of really how to serve Hashem, of what's going on in this world. That's why they're called the pillars, the forefathers of the whole world. There's a statement our sages make. Avot hen hen ha The forefathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, are themselves the chariots of Hashem. And this has all sorts of mystical meaning, but we can actually relate to this on a simple level as well that the forefathers, their whole essence, everything that they're about, they were so godly, they were such an example of overcoming the gross limitations, the eclipses, the, 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 the disqualifications of this world, and of, yet, of being in this world and yet making it a place for Hashem. So they're like the chariot that holds God, as it were, on the simplest level, that this is what it means to be godly. This is the essence of bringing godliness into the world. They're the very stuff of their lives. And since the forefathers were the first ones to, to really realize on the deepest level that the world is only about Hashem, only about recognizing God, only about making the most of every moment to, to connect with godliness in this world, Everything that they were doing was also about determining, now that we know that the whole world is about God, now what? How is He to be served? How is He to be recognized? How is everything that we do to be a reflection of the great knowledge and understanding that there is a God? That's what the forefathers are really all about. So they're putting all of this into motion, and they're so different. Avraham. Avraham Avinu was so extroverted. He was so um, action-oriented. He was innovative. He was very much the, the um, initiator of acts of kindness, looking for opportunities of kindness. He was out there completely. He was very social. He was interacting all the time with the world around him. He's identified with the aspect of chesed, of, of kindness. His son, Yitzchak, is the very opposite. The Torah testifies to him speaking very little. He was, uh, as Avraham was outgoing, he was more concerned with inner dimensions. He represents the aspect of gvura, of judgment of din, of harshness. He was bound on the altar, a totally different personality. Our sages tell us that Yaakov is the perfect admixture. Of the two, Midot of Chesed and Gvura, Yaakov is identified with Tiferet, a certain type of beauty, a certain type of, 
of combination, of balance, of truth. And here, in this week's parsha, the righteous Rivka is, from the very beginning of her pregnancy, totally overwhelmed and astounded and confused by what she perceives to be the struggle within her. And indeed, she's informed from on high that there is a huge struggle within her of two nations. It's two totally different worlds, two totally different cultures, two totally different ways of relating to the human experience, to God, to everything. And the Torah tells us that Rivka, she favored Yaakov. And she understood. And perhaps, as some commentaries point out, it's because of her background. She came from not such a good family. She came from a house of idolaters, and maybe it was hard to fool her because of who her father, Betuel, was. And so she recognized certain aspects of Esau's personality. Their sages tell us that Esau was a, was a perfect con man. He was very glib, he was very smooth, and he had convinced his father, Yitzchak, that he was absolutely righteous, that he was praying all the time, that he was studying Torah, and he would come to his father, Yitzchak, and ask him all kinds of questions in religion in, and in practice wondering how certain things should be observed and all sorts of hypothetical cases showing Yitzchak that he was totally wrapped around the idea of being of being good and keeping the Torah but it was really all a ruse even though there's one thing that our sages tell us about Esau that's so fascinating that Esau he had the garments of Adam HaRishon of the first man he had usurped them he had actually gotten them by by some means and in those days, before the Holy Temple and before the Kahuna, before the priesthood, Esav, when he put on those garments, those holy garments of light of the first man, and he would go and he would take care of his aging father Yitzchak. He would, he would bring him food, he would wait on him, he would, he would dote on him. So our sages tell us that was like the service of the Holy Temple, because he was the firstborn. And there was always a service, a divine service in the world, even before the Holy Temple. And when Esau would put on those clothing, they say he was like the high priest in the Holy Temple, serving. And his service was in taking care of Yitzchak, who was, who was the tzaddik. And it seems that Yitzchak really was fooled by the act that Esau was, was putting on. Or could it be that he wasn't fooled? Could it be that Yitzhak really did understand who Esav was, what his limitations were, how insincere he really was? But Yitzhak also had a certain, maybe, part of him that identified with Esav. Maybe a certain part of, of Esav actually reminded Yitzhak of his own father, Avraham. God forbid, not in his conduct. We, we learned that Esav was actually a terrible Russia. Unbeknownst to Yitzchak, he was actually very, very wicked. But in the aspect of his contact where Esav was so much in this world, he was so outgoing, he was so involved in worldly things, this must have reminded Yitzchak very much of his own father, Avraham. And he identified with this. He knew that the way to be in this world, really, which he didn't exactly master, the way to really bring Hashem's presence into this world is through this world through everything in this world. And on the deepest level, Yitzchak was really hoping that Esav would be the one who would bring the Torah into the world. He was hoping that Esav would really fulfill the role of being the firstborn. Because he looked at Esav and he looked at Yaakov and of course he loved Yaakov and he realized that Yaakov was a tzaddik, but he felt that Esav's path in the world is really the right way. Were it, be, were it to be something imbued with godliness, it could really elevate this world because Esav was so physical. And we always know, we always, we always study this point. This world is so important to Hashem, this physical world that we're in. We're not abstract people. We're very, very much involved in this world. Hashem put us in this world because this is the world that He loves. And everything about it, its very gross physicality 
is something that can be used for the service of God, something in which we have to reveal, something in which we have to, we have to somehow unveil to be godly. And Yitzchak felt on a deep level that Esav can do this because Esav is that type of personality. He's the man of the field. And that's really what we need in this world. The problem is that this Esav, who our sages tell us, was the single greatest example of honoring one's parents who ever lived. The single greatest devotee of the mitzvah, the commandments of kibud ave'em, of honoring one, one's parents, was exemplified by Esav. He was so totally dedicated with all his heart in true sincerity to the commandments of honoring his, of his, pa his parents. And he really was like the Kohen Gadol in the Holy Temple. But how could it be that the same Esav that was so devoted to his father and that is the primary example of honoring one's father, how could it be that when we continue reading in the Parsha and we find that the blessing was given to uh, Yaakov and Esav developed this tremendous hatred of Yaakov, Esav says to himself, in verse 41 of chapter 27, he says, May the days of mourning for my father draw near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. And this is an amazing thing. The same Esau, who is described to us by the sages as, without exaggeration, and in all sincerity as being the paragon, the absolute apex of the fulfillments of honoring one's father, the same Esau says, I just can't wait for my father to drop dead, and then I'm going to take care of, of Yaakov. How does that work? So you see, Esav, he really represents this capacity of elevating the world from its physicality to a sense of godliness and, and being imbued with and binding everything to God, as Yaakov does, and as Yaakov, that's his legacy. But Yitzchak was hoping that Esav would be able to do that, and Esav failed. And from the very beginning, when Yaakov confronted Esav over the birthright, what did Esav say? He said, I'm going to die. What do I need the birthright for? <laughs> I'm going to die anyway, meaning I don't believe that anything can last forever. I don't believe that this could be, that this whole deal here, this program, this setup could be eternal. I'm going to die. What do I need the birthright for? You know, we live in a generation today where everything is about I. iPhone, iPad, iTouch, whatever. You know who the original I man was? Esav. Esav says to Yaakov, just pour that red stuff down my throat. That's about as I as you can get. And I assure you, he had an iPhone, he had an iPad, and all that stuff. And he won't even call it by name. Pour my, down my throat, haliteni na. It's a very amazing Hebrew phrase in this verse. It tells us, and it literally means, just, I will open up my mouth, and I don't even want to be bothered. You know the classic, feed me, burp me, get me out of here. I, I don't have time for anything except my immediate gratification. Th this, is, this is where we learn it from, because Esav said, I can't even be bothered to eat. Haliteni na min ha'adom ha'adom hazeh means, I will open up my mouth and just pour the red stuff down my throat, I. And this is Esav's take of the world. What do I need the birthright for? I'm going to die anyway, anyway. So Yitzhak saw in him the potential of being able to do something grand, to do something great for the world, because what the world needs is someone who recognizes the, the beauty and the immense power and the importance of living in the physical world. And maybe Yitzchak felt that Yaakov was a little bit too removed from the world, because he was the, the complete person. He was in the tent, he was studying the Torah, and Yitzchak was concerned that the Torah has to be rooted in this world. And he actually thought that Esav maybe would be better equipped for that because of his nature, because of his derech. Because you see, what this is all about is not just about Yaakov and Esav. 
It's about you and me. It's about all of us. It's about what is the proper path in this world to serve Hashem. And that's why I said in the very beginning today, we're not just talking about an incident, an anecdote. We're not just talking about this business, about the blessings as important as it is and how it set the stage for the future development of the Jewish nation. No. Ma'aseh avot siman lebanim. We're talking here about huge, massive events of cosmic proportions, of such consequences that reverberate in the world today. What these great men were about, the Avot, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, they were blazing a trail for all humanity. And at this point, what we're up to right now in Parshat Toldot, Yitzchak is trying to determine what is the way to bring Hashem's presence into this world. And you know how it could be? The answer to the contradiction that we asked, how could it be that Esav, who was the great patron of honoring one's parents, was yet able to say to himself, and the Torah testifies, I can't wait for my father to drop dead. Is that a person who honors his father? Where's the love? Where is the honoring his father that we learned about? I'll tell you what the problem is. Esau's take on honoring his father was not because it was Hashem's mitzvah. It was because it's the way of the world. He brought me into the world. I honor him. But it was very secular. It was very devoid of, of the spiritual content. It was like this is what we do. This is, it makes sense to me. But when it made more sense to him to be, the, to be eye oriented, when it made more sense to him to worry about what he considered to be his particular agenda, let him just drop dead already. Because what was missing from Esau's worldview that would have succeeded in elevating the world was Hashem. And that he just couldn't get. I mean, do you ever ask yourself why the Parsha opens up? I mean, these things are so powerful. What we're learning about in this book, the Book of Stories, it was, it's been called Genesis, the Book of Stories, Sefer Breshit. These are not stories. These are the stories of our lives. That's what's going on here. Did you ever ask yourself, why does Rivka have twins? I mean, okay, the, there are these powers that are being refined and clarified and that are coming through the generations. And Avraham had a Yishmael and Yitzchak had an Esav, until we reach Yaakov and the twelve sons, okay. But why does Rivka have twins, and why are the twins Yaakov and Esav? Two opposing forces. Don't you understand, this is all of us as well. It's not just that there's the force of Yaakov in the world, and there's the force of Esav in the world, and that's clear enough. But this idea of determining the path, that Yitzchak was so concerned with who is the, the real firstborn, and who is going to receive the blessing of service of Hashem. Yitzchak's concern, like Avraham before him, was how are we going to bring a path of redemption to the world? What the Avot are concerned about here is bringing redemption to the world. That's what this is all about. And Yitzchak really was convinced that Esau had something going for him. And you know what is really sad and tragic about Esau? He really did. He really did have something going for him. And he could have been more influential in bringing a sweet redemption to the world, like Yaakov. And the problem is the I. The I aspect that, that Esau represents. And the problem is that Esau removed Hashem from the world. Our sages tell us that in the very day that Esau came tired from the field, what is this tiredness all about? On that day, he committed all the major sins in the Torah, including murder and sexual immorality and idolatry. He was exhausted. as a long day for Esau because his take was perfect as far as being in the physical, but he left out the God completely. And there, that role, that, that task falls to Yaakov through his voice, through the Torah, through bringing Hashem into every aspect of creation. But clearly, the, the plights of Yitzchak and Rivka and the legacy that they're trying to, to, to establish and the path of redemption for Israel and all humanity that they're trying to clarify, which we are reading about in this Parsha with the saga of the birthright and the saga of the blessings is about choice. It's about determining a path to bring blessing into the world, determining a path. And Yitzchak really was right. 
in hoping that there could be someone that will have the strength to be so totally rooted in the physical world, but yet to see God in everything. And to use the physical world, as Asaph could have, to elevate everything, to reveal the godliness in it. But Asaph, so wrapped up in his lusts, in his negative character traits, in his transient take of the world. Why do I need the birthright for? I'm going to die anyway. I don't believe that it's worth the effort of elevating this world to a level of spirituality. It's too much work. Esav missed the mark here. And it falls to Yaakov through the service of the establishments of the people of Israel and everything that they will do in every future generation, of setting the tone through what the Avot are doing, the massive, tremendous deeds of the Avot, it falls to Yaakov to establish the sovereignty of Hashem in this world and to elevate the physical world to a revelation, a constant revelation of the presence of Hashem.